Next, we've got Tom Johnson from the uh, Point No Point Treaty Council in Washington, and he's going to be uh, giving us a comparison of supplemental supplementation strategies to recover coho in Snow Creek, Washington, and a summary of some other approaches for supplementation interventions that have gone on in the Strait of San Juan de Fuca and the Hood Canal areas of Washington State. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you for the invite to the conference. This has been just phenomenal. A lot of information exchange, and I'll add my two cents or maybe 25 cents worth, and then uh, looking really looking forward to the other panels uh, coming up this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to quickly say that uh, I spent most of my career working for De uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I just retired from them this last summer and went to work for the Point No Point Treaty Council, but in the same geographic area. So I was the district uh, fish biologist for uh, WFW for about 30 years. I'm going to be talking about um, a couple of different things here. The supplementation rationale and approach that we use up in that region. Uh, I'll be a couple of examples then, the Snow Creek Coho Supplementation Program and then other regional supplementation programs, one for ESA-listed summer chum and one for ESA-listed steelhead. The uh, rationale was developed for the ESA-listed summer chum as part of the co-manager, i.e. state tribal managers, uh, as part of the summer chum conservation initiative. And this was rolled up into a, and was included as part of the uh, NIMPS approved um, recovery plan for the ESA listed summer chum. These same uh, approaches and rationale was applied to our Snow Creek coho. And I want to acknowledge Tim Tynan here. He was with WFW at the time of the development of these rationale and approaches. It was a work group, but I mean, Tim was our leader. And he's with the uh, NOAA Fisheries now up in uh, Lacey. Uh, just outside of Olympia. And I provided some supporting materials for the website. So if you go there, you'll get a whole lot more detail. I'm going to kind of take a, a semi-rapid uh, 30,000 foot approach to this. First, it's a very important that a key premise that we have is that salmon populations threatened with extinction can't be recovered to viable populations with uh, hatchery and harvest alone. Up in Washington, it, the co-managers, state and tribes, are pretty much have regulatory authority over the harvest and the hatcheries. Habitat issues are, are not so much. So commensurate with timely improvements in the condition of the habitat are necessary to recover the listed populations to healthy, uh, healthy levels. And I've heard that same theme here in other presentations, and I think it's a very good take-home message. So in the initiative, we looked at when to supplement or reintroduce, when to modify or terminate a program, uh, how to do it, and an m and &E, monitoring and evaluation. And I'm only really going to be hitting on, I kind of tailored this for the how-to, because I thought that's what the folks here wanted to see, but I'm going to sprinkle in some of the other stuff. So the general and specific standards that we had are to, to, to do two things. You want to address risks and ensure what we did was effective. So to address the risks, uh, we looked at a variety of strategies in the literature. Uh, these are the publications here and rolled them up and that became the basis for our rationale and approach. And this was done back, oh gosh, between 95 and 98, right in that time frame. Uh, and to ensure the effectiveness of the programs, uh, we went through a benefit risk assessment framework. And the benefits that we considered uh, were we wanted to reduce, reduce the uh, short-term extinction risk. We wanted to, to preserve the populations while the, while the factors for decline are being addressed. We wanted to speed recovery. We wanted to establish a reserve population for use if the natural population suffered a catastrophic loss. We wanted to reseed vacant habitat capable of supporting salmon. And we wanted to collect scientific information that would help inform other conservation programs. Uh, the risks that we considered included, well, what happens if you have a total or a par partial hatchery failure? And that could be a catastrophic loss of the, cat of the propagated stock. Uh, ecological impacts uh, to the natural origin fish through predation, competition, and disease transfer. 
uh, genetic effects to the propagated or the unpop unsupplemented populations, uh, the reduction within or among genetic diversity. Uh, the donor stock risks, uh, you wanted to make sure you didn't mine the populations and reduce them so that you had um, selection effects. And you also didn't want to pose risks to any of the other salmonids in the, in the watersheds. So some of the overarching strategies included uh, phased implementation of the individual programs and the regional programs. Uh, we had both supplemented and non-supplemented uh, areas. Uh, and that those non-supplemented areas should have comprised a representative spectrum of the existing diversity. Uh, we had allowable fish levels set to achieve the historical adult run sizes as the upper limit. You didn't want to grow a lot more fish than the, than the, than the habitat would normally produce. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, loss of genetic variability between populations. Um, some key standards are Propagate and release only the indigenous population. Transfer of each donor stock for reintroduction is limited to one target watershed, and that watershed should be adjacent to the range of the donor stock. Uh, you wanted to have the program fish be acclimated to the targeted stream. You wanted to foster local adaptation by using, return, once they start returning to spawn, you want to use both the program fish that were returning to spawn as well as those produced in the wild. And all summer chum produced in the hatchery programs would be marked so you can monitor and evaluate them. So you can also look at the loss of genetic variability within populations. We wanted to limit the duration of all the programs to the maximum of three generations. For chum, they're more like Chinook, they're three, four, and five year olds. Uh, to minimize the likelihood of divergence between hatchery brood stocks and the targeted natural stocks. Uh, we want to collect a representative brood stock from the natural spawning population, representing as many characteristics as we could, run timing, uh, size, age, sex ratio, and any other traits. Um, again, using returning adults produced by the program and the natural origin fish as a brood stock to increase the effective population size. We apply. We had a whole suite of spawning protocols that were developed by Steve Schroeder and Jim Ames uh, to ensure that the hatchery brood stocks did indeed represent the wild stock diversity and to equalize the contribution of the parents to the next breeding generation. And we set a, a targeted number of adults to achieve that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, M and E is the key. We've heard that over and over. In this workshop, monitoring and evaluation reporting is, is, is um, important. You can see here, and this is also in the supplemental stuff on the, on the website. If you go there, you'll see a whole suite of reports that we've prepared uh, on our summer chum, summer chum programs. And there's several pink and chum workshop papers and an AFS symposium paper and a variety of other things there. Um, so we prepared reports to summarize, analyze, and interpret the, the M&E data and to suggest any program revisions as needed. Um, we re those reports were uh, basically written by the co-managers and then reviewed but with the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, NOAA Fisheries to assess the effectiveness and effects of the programs. And the, any adjustments were needed were implemented, adaptively managing. So I'm just going to step through the summer chum one real quick. Um, this is the entire ESU. Here we are in, uh, we're about here now, and we're up here in the northeast portion of uh, western Washington. The ESU, there were two, popula two populations identified, uh, straight one, the Fuca population, and then Hood Canal. But it's one ESU, and this, this was a, a listed unit uh, beyond, uh, distinct from any, all the other chum in the, in the region. And what we did, we had a series of supplementate, whoops, supplementation program streams and reintroduction streams. And along the Street of Juan de Fuca, we hit Jimmy, with two streams, Jimmy Come Lately and Salmon Creek, and in Snow Creek, or Salmon Creek was used to reintroduce into, uh, Chimicum, and by reintroduce, meaning there was an extirpated stock there. We knew there was summer chum there at one time, 
they were gone, we wanted to get them back. Uh, Snow Creek, which I'll show you on this map, which I'll talk about for a coho, is right here, this little watershed right there. And then down in the canal, we had a series of supplemented, supplemented streams on the west side, one on the east side. The Union River was, was reintroduced into Tsuhuya, which had been extirpated. Um, Big Coal Seam was taken across to um, Big Beef Creek. And we also left unsupplemented streams uh, representing a diversity of the, of the programs. So now, oh yeah, the phasing in part. Uh, we started in 92 with a couple of programs, did our first couple of reintroductions in 96, started the Hammer Hammer program in 97. And I'm gonna show you right here, this is where Snow Creek Coho came in. So we had already done a fair amount of work with the supplementation approach before we got to our Snow Creek Coho right here. And then we phased in a couple of more. And it's important to note that all of these have been terminated except for Lilywap Creek and Tuhuya. Tuhuya is uh, earmarked for 2014. And Lilywap Creek has had some pretty severe um, issues with habitat and some uh, other things going there. So we've actually extended that program beyond the three generation. And there's a, whole, there's a whole suite of other things you have to do when you do that. And I'm not going to talk about those here, but they're all risk averse type things. So just a quick summary then. Uh, the population status is improving and it's on the trajectory for recovery. We looked at the VSP parameters and abundance has increased from a thousand, less than a thousand fish back in the uh, early 80s to, oh, heck, we had 100,000 one year, but it's basically been in the uh, five to 20,000 range now. Uh, the spatial distribution has improved. Uh, with those reintroductions, we re, we, we re uh, initiated naturally self sustaining now uh, populations in three streams. The diversity is maintained and improved. The diversity piece, again, that spatial distribution, but also within the streams, the fish are, because they're more abundant, moving further up into the streams. And the genetic diversity, uh, I'll talk about in a second. Uh, extinction risk was reduced from high to low to moderate in, in all cases. Uh, when we started these programs, there were 16 summer chum stocks we knew about, eight were extinct, and the, all the others, were, except for two, were at high risk of extinction. So that's why we started and decided to intervene when we did. <clears throat> um, I threw these in at the last minute, and the geneticists have to promise not to ask me too many specific questions. Uh, Mo Small, out of our WFW lab, has been the primary author on this. Uh, there's been no impact to the genetic structure or the effective population size. Um, and that, by that I mean we had baselines before, we have genetic uh, information during, and now we have some genetic information now that these programs have been uh, turned off. And the genetic profile that we had before programs is very similar to the genetic profile that we have now. And as far as the effective population size, it did go through some bottlenecks. The NE did go down, but as we turn these off and we're getting more spawners, we're getting um, an increase in that NE. <clears throat> and there was a um, study done in an artificial stream channel by Bear Berjikian and his NOAA fishery staff, and we, they found no significant differences in the reproductive success of the NORs versus the SORs. So now, Coho, and I want to acknowledge Sherry Scalf and, and Steve Schroeder from WFW uh, for their contributions. Snow Creek's a very small watershed, 50 square kilometers. It's about 10 miles in anatomous length, but WFW has had an upstream downstream trap there since 1976, can basically monitor everything in and everything out. We've got coho, steelhead, cutthroat, and summer chum, and there have been no hatcher releases into the watershed. And um, Snow Creek 
starts here at Discovery Bay, comes up and goes up into the upper watershed here. Most of these tributaries are really inaccessible uh, due to grading, grading at barriers. Um, it's got one major tributary, Andrews Creek, which goes up and into this, water, this portion. And then on Andrews Creek, it's got Crocker Lake. And um, the strategies I'll be talking about here quickly, I just I want to show you where they're located. They're in the upper watersheds. We've got an RSI in Snow Creek, one in Andrews Creek. And in, um, excuse me, Rube. God. A remote site incubator. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. What we have here is those brood lines we've been hearing about in the other presentations. Each one uh, was on a steep decline. Uh, there were var varying strengths when we started with the, with the work. What they were prior to this time, we really don't know. But they were all going down, and they were all bottoming them out. And this brood line, actually, with the strongest one, is, was now in the middle. So by the time 1998 rolled around, this was the situation we were dealing with. Possible factors for the decline were over-harvest in U.S. and Canadian commercial sport fisheries. Just like Larry mentioned, things have changed now, but this was the template at the time. Uh, habitat degradation, freshwater and estuary both. Uh, mainly logging and road, road building uh, associated with logging. And then the associated change in the hydrograph, uh, a lot of flashier flows, high flows, and a, a lot of bed load movement, just making it pretty inhospitable for the intergravel environment primarily, and also filling in pools and all of that. Uh, and we had uh, non indigenous warm water fishes, bass and northern pike, and Crocker Lake, uh, which is an important co rearing habitat. In the early years, uh, 77, 78 or so, we were. Uh, had small traps on Andrews Creek also and had quite a few coal coming out of there. So factors favoring recovery, uh, well, reduction in those coal harvests due to the U.S.-Canada treaties and the fishing regulations and the mark selective fisheries that have been implemented. We had substantial habitat improvements in the basin and the, the logging legacy has kind of healed. Is healing has been no new logging in the watershed. Uh, we were able to eradicate the non-indigenous fish from Crocker Lake with a lake rehab using Rotenone. In the summer of 1998, we went in there and had some public meetings shortly after that, because that was a fairly controversial thing, and uh, we initiated the coho supplementation program that fall uh, after considering the input that we got from the public. It was like 60, it was almost two-thirds of the people favored uh, going after a coho supplementation program as opposed to, oh, let's just put trout back in there, oh, let's just put bass back in there, and other management uh, approaches we could have taken. So now all the rationale and approaches that I talked about for summer chum, I'll just list them quickly here for what we did for coho. We used the native coho broodstock. Uh, it represented the uh, adult return timing, size, age, and other traits. Uh, we used all the adults that returned in those first couple of years. Uh, it was less than 100 fish. Uh, once the program adults started to return, we incorporated both NORs and SORs. We were going to limit it to three generations. It turns out we only had to go two generations. Uh, the egg take goal and number of fish released was based on the Snow Creek uh, smolt potential. And we had multiple release sites and strategies, which I already talked about a little bit. The RSIs in both Snow and Andrews Creek. We did a fall release of Pringerlings in the Crocker Lake and a spring release of pre-smolts in the Crocker Lake. And then we monitored and evaluated the heck out of it. So just real quickly, um, this is our trap on Snow Creek. It's a full spanning permanent weir and, and trap. There's an upstream trap here and a downstream trap just off the, off the side here. Uh, we captured the adults and held them in the watershed. We didn't want to move them out of the watershed. Uh, we held them in, in these perforated tubes and we could use these and, uh, for Chinook and, and actually some steelhead programs down in the Hood Canal. And it worked really well. You, you put a fish in there and they'd get real nice and quiet. You got, them, you got them labeled so you know when that fish was put in there. You got pink tags for females and blue tags for boys. And uh, you put them in the live tube uh, in the trap box and you um, 
can go in there and you sort through them and check for maturity. Other, the other option was to put them in, a, we had some tanks we were thinking about using, but whenever you go through and try to sort through the fish in a tank, they're just thrashing around. Uh, the spawning was done by our WFW hatchery staff. The eggs and milk were um, kept separate, and these are the uh, individually labeled uh, eggs and milk bags, and they're on, uh, they're, on they're, they're, they're in a cooler, they're in, they're in a uh, ice chest. And then the fertilization was going to take place at Herd Creek Hatchery. Um, we, we looked at a whole bunch of uh, biological parameters, and um, uh, dang it. we had behavioral, phenotypic, health, and genetic. Uh, the fertilization occurred at the at Kurt Creek Hatchery. We did two by two or three by three factorial crosses. So this would be half of one female, half of a same female, and male one and male two, say. And then each female's eggs was incubated separately in ISO buckets. We did our thermal marking on the otoliths there at Herd Creek Hatchery. We had unique codes each brood year and three thermal codes within each brood year, one for Snow Creek, one for Andrews Creek, and one for Crocker Lake releases. This is the incubator stacks and this is the chilling, the chilling box up above it. This is the inside Herd Creek Hatchery. And eyed eggs from each female were allotted into each treatment. So if, if something were to happen, say, to the Andrews Creek RSI in one year, you didn't lose a contribution from that particular female. Uh, and these are the general numbers. In the first few years, it was around 8,000. We had about uh, 30,000 total. And by the time we got up to the full program size, we were just under 70,000. Uh, this is a remote site incubator. Um, it's basically a 55 gallon poly drum. Uh, it's got egg trays in it. Below it, you've got these rugo substrate, uh, artificial substrate. The eggs, eyed eggs, are put into the incubator. The um, the eggs hatch and then work work their way down into the substrate. And you can stack several of these uh, egg trays. And we loaded these things very very lightly, um, 5,000 eggs per tray. This, took, this, is a, this is the Anders Creek site, and we needed landowner cooperation, and John Bolton was really good about uh, helping us actually find a spring. We needed a spring with about 10 to 12 gallons a minute, not a whole lot of water. Um, we found one on a little piece of his land, and we were able to uh, direct it into a clarifier. Into a clarifier where you take out all the flocculants and all the uh, sediments and whatnot, then it goes from there into the incubator, and this is what you, where you have your eggs. And then the fish volitionally hatch, or they hatch, they go down into the substrate, then all the trays are taken out once they're all, all down there, and then they come out volitionally into Crocker, into uh, um, Andrews Creek. Back at the hatchery, which is at a nearby, nearby watershed, Dungeness River, we applied standard, standard hatchery practices there to grow our pre-smolt groups, uh, but we had very, very light rearing densities. Uh, we applied coda wire tags to the fall and spring treatment groups. We had the coda wire tag detector or uh, injector for the snout tag, which was our fall release, and then we were able to use a, a syringe and an implant tag into the adipose fin. And then those fish were taken into Crocker Lake, which is about a 25-acre lake, now devoid of all those nasty predators, and uh, used our, that, that's one of our nicer trucks right there. <laughs> and then we uh, did the evaluation on the smolts, and uh, we were able to capture 100% of the fish going out of the system. And you basically sort them by treatment, you run them through a, 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 a wire, a quarter wire tag detector, and if they beeped, the, the person on this, you have a net, you know, a handheld net here. All the fish are taken from the trap up into here, and then you run them through the, the detector, and by beeps or no beeps, if it didn't beep, that meant it was a RSI fish or a natural origin fish. If it beeped, it had a, had a wire, and, and then you check by the handheld one whether the wire was in the snout or the adipose fin. And then you can count, and then you can run through a whole bunch of sampling on those fish, each fish, 
for each treatment, you can get abundance, migration, timing, size at smolting, age at smolting, and survival. And I'm just going to kind of touch on the, the bottom line here, one of the bottom lines, the numbers. And you can see for smolts, uh, the 1998 brood year would smolt in 2000. So we took the, in the first three years, it was all uh, program fish. And then these fish, and then the, last, in the next three years, we had natural origin fish as well as program fish. And then we said, you know what, we're, we're pretty, we set our target based on trying to achieve a level right in here. And we said, you know, we think we're there. So we turned it off and then <clears throat> they've taken off since. But this provided the boost. I'm convinced that without this boost, these low, low numbers of fish wouldn't have done this. They just, they just wouldn't have happened. Uh, a little bit of data. Uh, the egg to smolt survivals for the various strategies. Uh, the natural origin fish are at about two and a half percent. RSI is at seven and a half. Uh, October releases at uh, 17 and February at 36. These are primarily because they were, these fish were in the hatchery longer. And, um, but that's, that's a pretty respectable uh, RSI number. And you can see it's a three-fold increase in that case. And uh, what is that? Fifteen-fold increase in that case. So you can, you can really in increase the survival rates. Okay, on the adults, we looked at a whole bunch of stuff too. We sampled those fish, looking at all the various parameters we need, all the data we need to collect. And this is what we got for small to adult survivals. The NORs, uh, 7%, the RSI at 10. And the October and the February release is a little bit smaller. Each of these is significantly different from the other. These two are not. If you look at the egg to, egg to adult survival, um, you can see the NORs are at about 0.18%. You got about a five, four-fold increase to the, from the RSI, and then you got a 1% and almost 2% from the February release. So again, you can really boost it by, uh, doing a, by using these wild fish. And this is what the numbers look like. You saw this graph before in terms of brood lines. These are the natural origin contributions coming back. It was obviously mostly uh, program fish. These are the program fish for subsequent years. Again, we were, we were shooting for a number right in here. We turned it off and we're, we're taking advantage of some good marine survival right now. <clears throat> These are the trends in abundance by brood line. They were going down, they've all gone up. So you can use local native brood stock and represent the entire run. Programs can be implemented that address the hazards and risks to coho. They can be incorporated into existing hatcheries and utilize uh, the expertise of staff. Uh, new remote facilities can be developed that minimize risk and partners and volunteers are extremely valuable. Um, the program contributed to recovery. Each coho strategy produced both juveniles and effective adult spawners. Uh, the adult returns home to the release streams and also distributed further upstream than the RSI sites in each case and Crocker Lake was very important for rearing, and now we're seeing about 60% of our smolts have spent at least some time in Crocker Lake. So very important piece to the puzzle. And addressing harvest and habitat limiting factors also contributed to recovery, of course. It wasn't all done by, by the hatchery program. Uh, very quickly, we've got a DNA uh, archive tremendous set of information that has not been analyzed. We basically collected DNA on all the adults returning for that 12-year period. Uh, you could look at it in a variety of ways. Uh, you could track changes in effective population size, compare empirically derived with theoretical estimates. You could heritability of various traits. If anybody's interested, let's talk. <laughs> Uh, here's, a, here's, here's just one small picture of our volunteers up there at the Snow Creek RSI site. These guys went up there and did their, you know, Bill and, Bill and Fred were Monday and these guys were Tuesday. And, uh, and very, very quickly, the uh, Hood Canal Steelhead Project, it's a collaborative effort led by Noah Fisheries, Barry Barry Deacon and his group out of Manchester. 
It's a 16 year hatchery experiment. They're gonna, we're gonna be comparing supplemented and non-supplemented stream before, during, and after supplementation. So here's Hood Canal again. We've got um, supplemented streams on the Ducka Bush, Skokomish, and Dewado, and then control streams on Tahuya, uh, Dosi, and Quilsi, and Big Beef Creek. And the primary features are eyed egg collections from reds, which allows natural production to remain in the river and gives us a broad genetic representation. We have, we're going to age two smolts for feeding them at a, a regime to mimic the natural uh, growth rate in the, in the wild. And we're going to be doing, we have been doing uh, adult releases, uh, three, four, and five-year-old adults. And the benefits and drawbacks to the red sampling is, is are listed here. Uh, whoop, dang it. You can limit the number of eggs collected per female, which gives you broader genetic representation. Then both the natural selection and mate selection can occur in the wild. Uh, you don't have to have weirs or traps, and there's no pre-spawning or holding mortality. Uh, and you get high embryo survival in a hatchery. Drawbacks is you don't know what kind of damage you're doing to the non-collected embryos. Um, uh, you gotta go out there a lot, not only to identify the reds, but to recover those <coughs> embryos. And that means that's just a matter of uh, look, triangulating the reds and also uh, tracking TUs. Uh, the, these are, it's most appropriate for smaller programs. Our programs are like under 10,000 for eggs for two, two of the streams and about 40,000 for the other. And there's no pathology data. So that's it. Let's thank Todd. <laughs> All right, just a couple of questions. Um, I've asked Tom to join the panelists this afternoon, and he's graciously agreed. So you'll have the opportunity to ask more questions. Is there anything that you really want to get right now before uh, we go on any further? Um, being as you're in a uh, different region for uh, the federal agency, NOAA, um, what was the uh, approach and the relationship with the cooperation that, that you got and, and the effort and support of uh, getting something like this off of the ground? Uh, well, COHO were not ESA listed okay, up there, okay, but some are chum, some are chum are. Okay. And, and the answer is very, we worked very closely, but we had done the summer chum conservation initiative and that was uh, heavy to the harvest and the hatchery and the life history and the limiting factors and had done all that background work. All that work was taken and rolled into the, the salmon recovery plan that was developed jointly with NIMS. They basically adopted our, our, uh, our, pro, our hatchery and harvest pieces. We worked with the land, the land use managers up there as to counties, cities, uh, other regulatory agencies to get the habitat piece right. One more question. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, on that note there, can you speak to the uh, history of funding, sources of money and longevity, et cetera? Yeah, I wish I had more. Um, <laughs> we did this on a shoestring. I mean, uh, the COHO program, we got some HSRG funding. We had done the first three years. Steve Schroeder said, oh, I bet you I could write a proposal and get us some money. And he got like $30,000 for three years. So it helped. And... Uh, so that was a good thing. Um, HSA reviewed the, uh, the summer chum approach that we took, RSRP reviewed the summer chum approach, and favorable, glowing reviews, thumbs up, go forth and do good things, no money. But it, it was very uh, well thought of, and what came out of that was my agency and some of the local tribes and the NGOs and our regional fish enhancement groups came together and were able to get like enough money for the odolith analysis and the DNA analysis. We were doing the spawner surveys and um, doing the carcass collections and the age sampling and all of that anyway. You got a heart pounding question. I do. All right, one heart pound and then, and then Ben White will be joining us for his presentation. Go ahead. Sorry, oh no, my heart's still in my chest, but um, the, the 
<clears throat> I have a question in terms of, did you guys evaluate like the exosmolt smolt survival pre and post the rodent treatment of that lake? It's just, I mean, it seems like the, on Snow Creek, it seems like that lake is a key, com key component, a huge component of the success of the, the story there. And, um, I was just wondering if you had a comment on that. Yeah, yeah, we did. I, we do have that data from, uh, we, we have to estimate the egg based on the female and a 2,500 egg per female. So it's a PED, a potential egg deposition type starting point. But yeah, we, we definitely tracked that, and it, it went way the heck down. And, um, and in, in addition, though, we had all that logging and road building legacy and all the, the landslide sluffage and all, all, all the associated habitat impacts, too. So could I separate those two out? Hard to. But because we are now seeing such a predominant use by Crocker Lake of the coho, instead of getting 70 to 110 millimeter coho, we're getting steelhead size, you know, 140 to 180, 200. We're getting some 300 millimeter coho coming out of there. And, and, and they've all spent at least part of their time in Crocker Lake. We get a few, very few, age zero smolts uh, coming out of there. All right, let's thank Tom again, and then welcome our next presenter.